Okay, thank you for coming. Uh, today we have Professor Jing Park from American University. She's a distinguished scholar in the field of uh, Buddhist studies and also a director of the Asian Institute of Buddhist Studies, which she founded uh, at American University in Washington. Um, today, uh, first of all, I would like to point out this is the second lecture in the TUJ philosophy lecture series that we've started together with Professor Takeshi Morisato, right there. And uh, I would like to thank all of those who support us, uh, including Professor Lee Roser, uh, the ma uh, major coordinator of IH, Mosaic classes, as well as Professor uh, Howard, who's, I don't see him right now uh, among us here, but uh, I would like to uh, thank all of the people who are actually contributing and helping uh, us to get started and get going with this lecture series. Um, so today we have a very interesting topic, um, learning to live or Derrida and Buddhism, as you can see up there on the slide. Uh, without further ado, adieu, I will let Professor Park uh, start her presentation and uh, I invite you to listen and take notes, and then we'll have a Q&A session at the end. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a great pleasure and honor to be here. And uh, really, thank you for inviting me to here. Uh, last year, actually, I gave a talk at Temple University in Philadelphia. And this year, I'm giving a talk here at Temple University, Japan. So it looks like there's a kind of theme going on. And uh, today's uh, theme of my talk today is, as you see here, learning to live or Derrida and Buddhism. So as you might know, Derrida is a French philosopher. I will talk to you more later. And Buddhism is Asian tradition. So I thought that this is a very good topic for a Temple University Japan, right? East to Mr. West and East to West comparative studies. Um, so to Learning to live, finally, that is my, one of my first uh, title. Jacques Derrida is a very well-known uh, French philosopher, perhaps one of the, one of the most influential uh, continental philosopher, Western philosopher in the second half of the 20th century. Uh, he died in 2004, October 4, 2004, after he struggled with cancer. Two months before his death, Derrida had an interview with Le Monde, as you know, a very well-known French uh, daily newspaper. And the interview begins with a discussion about Derrida's remarks. Good. I would like to learn to live, finally. This is a passage Derrida mentioned in one of his books titled The Spectres of Marx, but we're not going to go there. But when I read this interview and reread this passage, I was thinking, what does it mean that he was, uh, Derrida was 74 years old at the time. A 74 year old, world famous uh, philosopher who is uh, struggling with a terminal cancer, saying that I'd like to learn to live. And finally, right? you attend a class, you attend a school, you take courses, I have courses, but I, I, I wonder whether I teach my student how to live, right? What does that mean? Where do we learn how to live? At the end of my presentation, I, I cannot promise that I have an answer to this, but I want to throw out this question as a kind of a theme that we'd like to think about. And I will do it by using, by discussing two uh, philosophical tradition, Derrida and Buddhism. And this is comparative philosophy. As you know now, Jacques Derrida is a 20th century French philosopher. And Buddhism is a very well-known Asian religious philosophical tradition. Here you have East and West, ancient and contemporary. By putting them together, we can ask these questions. What do they share in common? And where do they diverge from each other? And finally, what do we learn by doing these comparative studies, which we cannot learn when we read Jacques Derrida 
separate independently or when you think about Buddhism independently. Okay. So let me start with uh, Jacques Derrida first. Jacques Derrida was born 1930 and he died, as I mentioned, 2004. Derrida was a Jewish French born in Algeria where he spent his childhood. Okay. So remember, he's, he's a French, but he was born in Algeria, which was a French colony at the time. And also, he spent his childhood there, and he was a Jewish. Now, Derrida's philosophy has been notorious for difficulty. It is really sometimes very, very kind of complex. When I first read Derrida in the grad school, all class, all entire class was screaming, right? what is going on here? And one of the reasons, there are several reasons why it's difficult to read Derrida, but one of the reasons is that Derrida's interpretation of a text is very creative, right? The thing that we usually do not think that he got it from some, some text. So, uh, but I think that even though Derrida's philosophy is very complex and uh, notorious for its difficulty, if we approach it from his life experience, perhaps, it is a little bit more accessible. And that's what I would try to do today. Okay? So let me give you a story uh, from his life. So here's a story of little Jackie. So Jacques Derrida was called Jackie when he was a child. So once again, the Derrida was a Jewish French born in Algeria where he spent his childhood. So one day in 1942, so Derrida was born in 1930, so he was 12 years old. School official called him to his office and said, quote, you are going to go home, my little friend. Your parents will get a note, end quote. That was, Derrida was, that was how Derrida was expelled from his school with no explanation. So just imagine the 12 years old. You are 12 years old, kind of elementary school or middle school, and suddenly a school, a school principal come to you and say, go home. Your parents will tell you what, what happens. Obviously, you will be freaked out, right? Then I went home. He didn't know what, what happened. So what had little Jackie done to be expelled from the school? Can you tell? The answer is already on the slide. He was a Jewish. That was the only reason he was expelled from the school, right? That is what we call anti-Semitism, 1942. Little Jackie did not understand what was going on. And as a 12-year-old boy, he did not know what anti-Semitism was and why it existed. But given that, again, he is only 12 years old, we can say that we can explain it to him, right? So in this case, if little Jackie did not understand what was going on, that's a simply lack of knowledge. You can tell him this is what is called anti-Semitism. But that is not an issue. Jacques Derrida later asks, as a grown-up, do we know better about why and how such a discrimination exists in our society? Right? So here, you already perhaps hopefully see that this is not only the issue of anti-Semitism, but any kind of discrimination that exists in our society. Do we know? why they exist, how they exist, and how we get it over. Right? So there is also another layer of exclusion. Derrida was expelled or excluded from school because he was a Jewish. Right? I told you. But those who expelled him were not Germans. They were not Hitler's people. He was expelled by the order of his own government. That was his own country. French government practiced anti-Semitism. So here you see a kind of a double exclusion. Exclusion based on your race, and then exclusion by your own government. Now what would you do if your society says you are wrong? Not because that you've done something wrong, but because of your race, for example, or your gender, or your social class, or your sexual orientation. Nowadays, I think we 
In the United States, we encounter a lot of these problems, and I believe that Asian society, including Japan or, or Korea, are not exception. More and more, we see this kind of diverse people live together, and then this kind of discrimination become very popular in our society, and how to deal with it, that issue becomes one of the major issues in our society. So what would you do if your society said, you are wrong because you are a woman. You are wrong because you are a Jewish. You are wrong because you don't have money in a capitalist society. So there are two options if that happens. And society tell you, you are wrong because you are a woman and behave this way. Then the first reaction could be you try to conform to the judgment of the society, right? And try to change your attitude and try to behave the way that society tells you how to behave, right? And the other option is really to think about why this happens, right? Why do society tell me I'm wrong behave in certain way simply because I'm a woman, or I'm an Asian, or I'm Jewish, or I'm at the margins of society who do not have money in a capitalist society, right? So after that experience of being expelled from the school, Dega says that in order to explain his experience of being expelled from the school at the age of 12, he needed to create a philosophical system to explain this. And that philosophical system is later come to known as deconstruction, the trademark of Jacques Derrida's philosophy. So then now we need to know what deconstruction is. Obviously, there are a lot of different ways of explaining deconstruction. But here, in connection, in the context of our discussion, deconstruction examines the impact of the logic of exclusion. Okay? Exclusion in our thought values and understanding of the self and others. If we think about our society, we realize that society is actually, our society is structured around the rule of exclusion based on the dualism, right? There are two extremes in a dualist system, and these two extremes are not innocent. They always function hierarchically. So, for example, we have a man versus women, and women have been excluded from the center of the society, which is a patriarchal system, right? Or have versus have not in a capitalist society, in which we constantly have a problem of those who have money and those who do not. Or the West versus East. In modern society, in modern time, the West kind of occupied a center of the world and values, and eventually that created what you call imperialism and colonialism at the beginning of modern time. And then there's all kind of center and margins. Against this kind of fixed concept of women versus men or the East versus West, Data claims that our identity is not a fixed one, but constantly being made through difference from others and also their trace. So here I said difference and trace. These are two of major concepts in Derrida's philosophy. So take the example of presence. You are all here. <clears throat> you are present. Some of you, because your professor forced you to come, so then you can get extra credit, right? So the idea of presence, when we think about it, we usually think that presence, it means presence. It has nothing to do with its opposite, which is absence. But then I would ask you to think about that again. Can you think about the concept of presence without the concepts of absence? If you do not know the concept of absence, the concept of presence cannot function, right? The same is the case with another example, for example, inside and outside. 
We are inside this room, and outside the door is the outside. But if we do not have outside without the wall, inside does not make sense. Right? The concept of inside is possible only when we think about outside, that it's opposite. In other words, in the concept of inside, outside is already there as a trace. Right? And inside functions as inside because inside is not outside, because of inside is a difference from outside. Right? So inside and outside, or uh, the presence absence, which we usually consider as a two totally opposite concept, now we realize that they actually are interconnected, mutually create identities. Right? So inside is inside because the concept of outside remains in the concept of inside. Derrida calls this the trace, let us, right? And inside is inside because of its difference from non-inside, which is outside. They are called this the difference, the difference, right? So, so data says that only through difference, difference, and trace meanings become possible, values become possible, right? There is no absolute value or absolute meaning of anything. <coughs> Okay, so as I said, our existence or meaning structure is possible through difference and trace, and they call this combination the text. Now we know English expression text, right? When you read a book or something like this, we call it text, right? But what data says text is not just a book. It is the kind of ecology, the kind of environment we exist. For example, in this lecture hall, we are all in the same text and context. I, as a lecturer, is possible. The idea of lecturer is possible because you are there as an audience. Perhaps I can just talk by myself without audience, but that is not the kind of idea of giving a lecture, right? So the moment I say I'm the lecturer in this context, in this hall, the you as an audience is led in the concept of lecturer as trace. Right? Now, stop there, we'll come back to this, and then let's briefly go to the Buddhism. So, how do we con make a connection with uh, Derrida's idea of difference, trace, and text uh, with Buddhism? So what are the major teachings of Buddhism? Obviously, there are a lot because Buddhism has 2,500 years history. Buddhism started in the 5th century before Common Era. So there are a lot of uh, complex uh, philosoph Buddhist philosophy we can discuss. But in the context uh, of our discussion, let me explain to you about this. The Lankavata uh, scripture, which is one of the major scripture in early Buddhism, the Buddha, founder of Buddhism, criticize the philosophers that they look at the world with an assumption that there exists a certain kind of foundation of the world, certain kind of unchanging essence, ground of the world. That is usually kind of what philosophers uh, uh, do philosophizing, right? The kind of metaphysics. But the Buddha thought that that is not the way we should understand the world. Right? The Buddha also criticized philosophers that they look at the world from the dualistic perspectives of the self and others, as if the self, me, and others, you, are totally two unrelated concepts. And the Buddha says that his teaching goes against such a foundationalist and a dualistic worldview, and he teaches what he calls the middle path, the middle. So what is it between me and you, self and others, the middle? Uh, one of the ways that Buddha explains this is, uh, is this way. This is uh, Buddha's conversation with his disciple. 
And the Buddha says, people look at the world from two extremes. This exists is one extreme. This does not exist. That is another extreme. Away from these two extremes, extremes, the Buddha claims to teach the middle path. So once again, what is in the middle? This exists, existence, and this does not exist, non-existence. In between, what is it, ghost? The Buddha explained this through the concept of relational identity, which Buddhist technical vocabulary expression is a dependent co-arising. In Sanskrit, it is called Pratitya Samupada. And basically, the idea is this. When this happens, that happens. When this stops exist, that stops exist. In other words, everything exists relationally. Right? Like, uh, there are various different translations for Pratitya Samapada, but I like this idea of dependent co-arising. ING form in English, it is happening, right? There is no kind of a static moment in Buddhism. Things are constantly happening in connection with one another, right? So one of the ways the Buddhism explained this idea is through the Indra's net, okay? Just to look at these two examples of the net, and imagine this net is kind of stretched like infinitely in the entire cosmos, okay? And imagine yourself as one of this uh, jewel. Each jewel is transparent. It does not have its own color or shape. It has a shape, but its own color, right? So if you imagine yourself as one of this uh, jewel, how would you describe the nature of your identity? When you look at one of this jewel, what do you see? What do you see? You see the reflection of all other jewels, right? And this is the Buddhist way of explaining your identity. Your identity is not something fixed here, but your identity becomes possible by the kind of interaction with all the other things which you do not consider as yourself. Just to give you an example, it's too early for dinner, so you had a lunch. What did you eat for lunch? Sandwich, sushi, soba, water, <coughs> or tofu. Okay, what did I eat? Oh, I ate a noodle, okay. I ate noodle, and I don't think noodles are me, right? I'm not noodle, but <laughs> I don't think I'm a noodle, I'm noodles, but I ate noodles and noodles became me, right? I drank water and I don't think I'm the water, but by drinking this water, I survive. I'm sure I'm breathing oxygen, right? I don't think I'm oxygen, but by breathing oxygen, I survive. What it means is that what I call myself is actually possible by the con contribution of all those non-me things. Noodles, water, oxygen, coffee, sandwich, soba, right? This is what this uh, Indra's net of Buddhism trying to teach us, right? So, uh, Huayan Buddhism is one of the Buddhist school. And Huayan Buddhist thinker Fa Zhang, a uh, Chinese Buddhist thinker of the 7th and at the beginning of 8th century, he had a very kind of a great <coughs> philosophical system to explain this idea of a Buddhist concept of the identity. And he kind of used the notion of uh, mutual identity and mutual containment. In other words, one's identity is possible because the identity of others become contained within your own identity. So before I give an example of me and food, right? 
Now take the example of these numbers. Imagine numbers 1 through 10. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. And imagine these 10 numbers are entirety of numbers. OK, we have numeric system. Take one number out of 10. Which number you want to choose? 3? Let's do 3. OK, number 3 is not number 2, is not number 4. So number 3 is different from number 2 or number 4 or, or any other 9 numbers, right? But in order for number 3 to function as number 3, you need all 9 numbers, right? Without these 9 numbers, number 3 cannot be number 3, right? So here, perhaps you begin to see the difference between our common sense understanding of number 3 and Buddhist way of looking at number 3. We usually, when we see number 3, we see number 3, which is different from number 2 and number 4. And we stop there. But Buddhism says that, well, but number 3 is number 3 because all other numbers exist in number 3. How? As trace, like Derrida said. Right? So number 3 is number 3 because the number 3 is uh, different from other numbers. Number 3 is not 2 or 4 or 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. And at the same time, within the number 3, there is a trace of all other 9 numbers. Right? The number 3 and other numbers dependently attain their identity. So before I introduce you the concept of dependent co-arising, right? Number three and other numbers become their own, number three, number four, number five, by mutually helping each other. Derrida explained the things through difference and trace. Likewise, Buddhism explains identity through dependent co-arising or mutual containment and mutual identity. Right? Now, so here is a, so far I briefly presented to you the Derrida's idea, deconstruction, and uh, also briefly presented to you one of the major concepts in Buddhism. Through Derrida and Buddhism, we noted that both philosophies emphasize the problem of dualistic identity, which emphasize kind of two extremes good and bad, right and wrong, or light and darkness. The both of Buddhism and Derrida, Derrida and Deconstruction, problematize this dualism and claim that our identity is always already connected with others. Right? Light is light because we have a concept of darkness. Inside is inside because we have the concept of outside. If so, now we have a follow-up question, right? Why is it important to Derrida and the Buddha to remind us of this reality of our existence, right? OK, number three is number three, and it has all other numbers in it. So what, right? So I spent 30 minutes just to explain you all these things. And now, uh, OK, I understand. But why do we need to pay attention to this, right? So what? Derrida has a reason why he focused on this idea of deconstruction and the logic of exclusion. Just to remember that he has experience as a 12-year-old boy who was excluded from school simply because he was a Jewish boy, right? So Derrida identified this hierarchical dualism as the foundational logic of Western philosophy. And he characterized the nature of this philosophy as violence. Right? Obviously, in his experience of being expelled from the school, he experienced the violence, right? His government kind of forced him to leave the school. So actually, after he was expelled from the school, all the Jewish boys who were expelled from the school, they were sent to Jewish school. But Derrida said he didn't like Jewish school, so he didn't go to school just to play hooky for about a year. So. Just such a kind of world famous philosopher like Jacques Derrida, he just didn't want to go to school, so he just played around. 
right? In his book of grammatology, which is his first uh, book, Derrida identifies three levels of violence. Okay, when, we, when you hear this expression violence, what do you imagine? What is your understanding? Violence, somebody just hit you like this, right? Physical kind of uh, uh, violence. This is your concept of violence, right? We have a lot of violence in our society, but Derrida's concept of violence goes deeper. Derrida explains the three levels, the three layers of violence. The first violence begins with language. And the second le level of violence is a moral system and the law. And finally, when the first and second level of violence make the third level of violence possible, that is usually what you think as violence, right? Physical violence, rape, war, and so on and so forth. Why is language violence? Language, the function of language is to make distinctions, right? So when you use language, already you define things by saying that this table is, uh, how do you define this color? This table is yellow, right? But this is not exactly yellow. This is not exactly brown. This is not exactly white. But we understand if we say yellow, right? So in some way, there is already a violence from Derrida's idea. Okay. For example, to you, Jin Park is a professor, right? So that is your definition of Jin Park, but I have all other different kind of roles that I play in my life. So when you define somebody just one language in linguistic expression, that is already violence from Derrida's perspective. And then, moral system and the law, why are they violence? Usually we tend to think that the moral, morality is good, right? Because it keeps people moral. And the law is good because the law keeps us safe in a society. Is that right? That is perhaps true, broadly speaking. But if you think about it, who created morality? Who make moral rules? When I say this clicker is good, Based on what do I say that, right? What it means is that moral rules always have author. An individual, a community, or society. And when there is an author, that means there is always inside and outside, right? The law is the same. Law is created in a society, but it's not everybody creating the law, right? And in order to create the law, you have to put complex system into a kind of rules and argument. So that already, in the Indian terms, uh, makes heterogeneous, uh, diverse reality into a homogeneous rules or the law, right? From there, we get to the third level of violence. Now, there is a deconstruction is basically about this, the kind of violence we experience in our society. He started with a rather theoretical idea like a difference and trace, but in his later work, he began to apply this idea, the logic of exclusion and its violence in his discussion of social political issues. So he talked a lot about the immigration issue which is a big issue in the United States nowadays, but even during this time uh, in France, and asylum seekers, and even death penalty, right? Is it kind of a right that we can put someone into death from human artificially, right? And finally, the questions of animals and, and sovereignty, which I will address shortly. Now, then how about Buddhism, right? Buddhism, Buddhism does not actually have explicitly social political philosophy. One of the reasons for that is that Buddhism, Buddhist temple, Buddhism's emphasis is more on individual cultivation. Okay? The Buddha teaches, the Buddha encourages individual to cultivate oneself. And by doing that, 
make you a better citizen, better people, better individual in a society. However, the Buddha's teaching focuses on the suffering caused by the violence that Derrida mentions that occurs because people fail to see the reality of their existence. Actually, suffering is another important concept in, in Buddhism. And when you talk about suffering here, it does not simply mean the kind of suffering we uh, use in the daily experience. But still, the, the goal of Buddhist teaching is to get rid of suffering, right? So in Buddhism, whatever actions that causes suffering to you and others are unrecommendable, akusala. It's not recommendable action. And whatever actions that make a contribution to get rid of suffering for you and for others, they are the actions the Buddhism recommend, akusala. Right? So, In this context, we can address a little bit about the Derrida's last kind of the Derrida's work in his uh, kind of uh, last stage of philosophy. In his later works, Derrida addresses the problem of dualistic categorization in terms of a categorical division between human and non-human animals. So from the very beginning, we talk about the problem of a dualistic world, worldview, right, inside and outside. Uh, uh, presence and absence. Now, the kind of ultimate, one of the ultimate kind of extreme case that are kind of discussed is uh, human and animals. And there that uh, says that, well, we usually use this expression, the animal. We don't even, in English, we don't even, in French too, we don't even use uh, a plural as animals. We simply use animal. Right? In, in Japanese too, in Korean too. As if all animals are the same. Right? But we know that is not true. A cow is different from rabbit, a rabbit is different from cat, cat is different from tiger, tiger is different from lion, and we call them all the animal. Right? And Derrida says that as soon as we use the expression the animal, we put them in a cage as if they are all the same. Now here's another example why language is violence. Right? And if you push this idea a little bit further, even within human beings, when we say all humans are equal, this does not mean actually all humans. Right? In old time, it meant men who were male who were not slaves. Right? Women were not part of this all men, all human beings are equal. And this, uh, his discussion of animal appears in his book called uh, The Animal That Therefore I Am, L'Animal Que Donc Je Suis. If you are familiar with uh, the Western philosophy, you immediately see that he's playing a game here, right? So the animal that therefore I am, he was kind of making a parody of Descartes' idea that I think, therefore I am, right? Descartes said, I think, therefore, I am, as a declaration of a human being, as a rational being. And there they here say, not really, right? The animal that therefore I am, we are part of all this kind of li living group, which is we are human animal, and there are non-human animals, right? And just to give you some idea of what happened in this book is that actually, <laughs> Jack Derrida was uh, kind of uh, talking about his cat. He was, uh, he was about to take a shower, he's naked, right? And his cat is uh, looking at him, right? Following him to his uh, kind of uh, bathroom. And he says, oh my God, I'm naked and my cat is looking at me. Have you ever thought about that? If you have a cat or dogs and you're naked. <laughs> so here are two things. The nakedness and the gaze looking at something. These two are something we always think of from human beings' perspective. Animals are naked. Usually those uh, pets uh, living in a city like Tokyo or Washington, DC, they sometimes get dressed very well. The, the <laughs> owners dress them very well. But usually animals are naked, right? So nakedness is natural. Humans are the ones who cover themselves 
cover their sexual organs, right? So naked, and the human being look at the animal, but they do not think that we are being looked at by the animals. By problematizing this idea, Delta is really, I think, reaching the kind of a maximum of deconstructing human-centered world, right? If you think this is a bizarre idea, thinking about you being looked at and naked by your cat, once again, just replace this idea with any other human beings who are not at the center of the society, right? Men look at women. That is why women's body is an object of men's gaze. And usually we do not think that the, uh, the man is looked at by men. Nowadays, is it possible? But usually that's not what you say, right? So that kind of center and margin plays here again. So Derrida's deconstruction of dualistic categories reaches its peak in his dealing of animals. And in his last seminar that he gave before his death in 2004, was titled The Beast and the Sovereign, La Bête et le Souverain. Here now, from animal, we move to the beast. What are the differences between the two, the animal and the beast? Cat, is cat a beast? Mm, not really, right? Lion, we call, could call a beast, beauty and the beast, we have that, right? I wonder what the lion himself would himself or herself think that he or she is beast, not animal, right? In other words, what it means is that the concept of beast is also very human-centered concept. And in this uh, seminar, The Beast and the Sovereign, Derrida points out that the beast, right, and the sovereign, sovereign here means the, the head of the nation state, head of the community, they, are the same, they share the same position with regard to the law. How is this so? Beast, lion, and your king, if you have a king, are in the same position with regard to the law. That is because beasts are not subject to the law, right? And the sovereign is not subject to the law. Beast is not subject to the law because beast is below the law. The sovereign is not subject to the law because sub sub sovereign is above the law, right? In this sense, we might say that sovereign and the beast, they are at two extreme with regard to the law, but the sovereign then locates itself at the other end of the dualistic power structure from the beast, but then through the very right and power to suspend the rights of others. The sovereign has a power, right? The sovereign always carries a potential to become a beast, right? We know many leaders who behave like a beast, right? No allusion to anybody at this point, but. <laughs> but, so here we have very interesting kind of juxtaposition, dualistic kind of model, but dualism breakdown very quickly. As much as the beast and the sovereign are on opposite sides of the scale of values and powers, they can quickly come to be on the same side. Right? So, I'm almost at the end. <laughs> the beast and the sovereign and the world. Now let's think about this. The beast and the sovereign, animals and humans, both, we have all these kind of juxtapositions. But, we all live in the same world at the same time, do not live in the same world, in a way, right? Me and uh, those uh, rich people, the 1% of the rich people who get uh, how many percent of the world wealth? They and me, we live in the same, on the same planet, but not really on the, in the same world, right? Just as there is this difference between animals and humans, between the beast and the sovereign, among human beings, uh, differences exist between different groups, right? Men and women, those who have, those who do not have, and so on. Different groups live in the same world, but at the same time, we do not live in the same world, right? What justifies this differentiation and discrimination? 
as it puts it, between my world, my world, and the world, the other worlds to which I belong, there exists infinite gap, even though we live in the same world, right? Now what do we do then? But the members of all these different groups, including the beast and the sovereign, share one thing. What do they share? They are all living beings. They are all alive. Lion and king and, uh, and the president and uh, housemaid, they are all living beings. To be alive also means to be a being with limitation. Living beings means that there is an end of this life comes to an end, right? A finite being. Mortality thus be uh, emerges as a condition of existence for all the beings in all the different genres, be they beast or sovereign. And awareness of mortality makes us realize that solitude is a fundamental condition of existence. Right? Solitude, the feeling of being alone, right? Being alone, in turn, ironically also reminds us of the existence of others, right? It is like inside and outside gap, right? If you do not know there are other people, I don't think you would feel lonely, right? If we were not aware of the existence of others, of those who might feel the gaps created by our solitude, we would not be even aware of our own solitude and aloneness. I, with my mortality and my solitude, and you, with your mortality and solitude, constitute the world. Right? And Dorida says that there are two types of solitude. The natural solitude derived from the mortality and the limitation of a human being, and the solitude imposed by society, which he calls the solitude of the law. Once again, you can remember here the kind of uh, logic of exclusion that your own country kind of kicked you out of school. Right? Law here does not mean only actual legislation, but all forms of exclusivist moves that occur in our communal existence. Right? Buddhism tells us how social imposed solitude as much as the natural solitude, our mortality, causes suffering to me me and our fellow beings, and you, and ask us to remind ourselves of our common ground of existence, that we are all living beings who can feel pain and suffering if violence occurs, right? This awareness is a starting point of Buddhist practice of compassion. Compassion is different from sympathy in Buddhism. Compassion means to feel with others, not feel for others, right? to feel the suffering of other beings and to make efforts to alleviate their sufferings as much as my suffering, right? So finally, learning to live finally. Learning to live is perhaps learning anew each and every time we encounter life. And perhaps it is learning the impossibility of mastering life. It would be nice if we say that this is the way to learn to live but that is exactly not how we learn to live, right? Derrida never confessed that he had learned to live, but his deconstruction, which he helped us to constantly pay attention to the logic of exclusion, teaches us that a constant and consistent self-deconstruction brings us close to how to learn to live. And the Buddhist encouragement to constantly practice compassion, to live together with other beings, is another way of learning to live each and every day. Thank you. I would like to thank Professor Park for, the, for her lecture. And I would like to invite you all for a session of questions and comments. So please go ahead and ask your questions.
Mark. Thank you. And again, welcome to Tokyo. Thank you. And for your um, interesting talk. Uh, there are a number of students here who have done some study of Buddhism, uh -huh. a little bit, and so I'm going to try to speak in a way that will um, include them. For Pratitya Samuppada, for dependent arising, uh, as I understand it, it's actually in two sections. The teaching comes in two sections. The first section we might call samsara, where the interconnectedness of all things, the, the fact that everything is dependent, is actually the situation of suffering. Of course, this is based on ignorance. Right. Right. So the fact that there's separations or dualisms is already there as part of suffering. Right. Whereas the solution, as I understand it, right. is the ceasing mm -hmm. of every single factor of our self-world existence. Every single, from, from, from ignorance right through, mm -hmm. every single factor is said to cease. Mm -hmm. And then usually, at least for Gautama's teaching, there's silence. Right. Says, but nirvana is supposed to be the extinguishing of tanha or, or um, craving or clinging. And this, this cessation, um, this enlightenment of this full cessation right. of all these factors uh, seems to be central to the teachings of Buddhism. Is there anything like that in Derrida? Now, that is a very interesting question, and I think that's one of the essential questions when you compare Derrida and Buddhism. So, um, about ten, ten some years ago, I uh, published an edited volume <coughs> called uh, Buddhisms and Deconstructions, and there are a number of articles that compare Derrida's, Buddhist, Derrida's deconstruction with uh, various uh, Buddhist uh, ideas. And one issue constantly comes up is this, uh, is there a kind of enlightenment in Derrida's idea, right? Something as you just uh, uh, asked. And another part is from Derrida's perspective, well, Buddhism has a final goal, which is enlightenment, whereas in deconstruction, there is no final goal. So from Derrida's uh, Derrida perspective, uh, enlightenment could be another metaphysics. And my response uh, in the introduction was that well, that is not exactly how enlightenment or deconstruction works. It is true, deconstruction works as a constant uh, movement, right? So that is why Derrida didn't want to call deconstruction as any, any ism or any words or system. Deconstruction is a play, event, constantly happening, right? But then, this practice itself Deconstructive practice itself, I would say that is something similar to a Buddhist practice, right? Practicing deconstruction itself is similar to Buddhist practice. Now then the question is, is there really the moment of cessation, enlightenment in, in Buddhist in deconstruction? The answer should come from this, this uh, kind of a, a path. What is enlightenment? What is the cessation in Buddhism, right? Does the cessation means actually you stop everything, and then what happened? We live in the world. We live in the samsara. Everything constantly happens, right? And the cessation is another kind of beginning of uh, practice. So in Buddhism course, usually my students always ask, what happens after enlightenment? Right? What happens after cessation of suffering? Then I say, wrong question. Right? There is no after the, after the enlightenment, right? Enlightenment is our kind of idea of constantly practicing this uh, uh, dualistic worldview, right? To, to challenge the dualistic worldview and trying to get rid of suffering, living in the samsara, right? As far as we live in this samsara, things will constantly happen, right? And if, if there is a person who is enlightened, the person will live in this world too, right? And that the person will constantly face the kind of challenges of samsara. And that is not just a cessation, right? And that is also th something that is related to Buddhist ethics. When people talk about Buddhist ethics, somebody says that, well, once you obtain the enlightenment, 
you will automatically help other people practice compassion. And I said, that is not exactly the way I think about Buddhist ethics. The example is Buddha himself. After Buddha obtained enlightenment, he didn't automatically help the other people. Actually, the Buddha didn't want to talk about his enlightenment. He thought that people would not understand him because it's too difficult. And then Brahma, the god, needed to persuade the Buddha, please, please help other people. There could be some people who could understand your ideas. Even the Buddha did not automatically help the others. I mean, that means that cessation is not the way I see that. The cessation is not some kind of a staging moment. Cessation is the kind of idea that we should constantly practice this idea of getting rid of suffering. I hope that. Maybe, uh, maybe this is linked to the later idea, starting with Nagarjuna, that this cessation or emptiness exactly. is actually the same thing as suchness, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. or briefly, that nirvana is samsara. Exactly. It's not really a separate um, uh, modality or a separate state or right. condition that's separate from samsara, but would be, so the s ceasing would be simultaneous with Paticca Samuppada. Right, right, exactly. So as it, it, you just mentioned, yes, uh, later Buddhism is uh, clearer about this. Samsara is nirvana, nirvana is samsara. In the Mahayana Buddhist tradition, that is clearly the answer to your question. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Yes. Thank you. This is an amazing. This is to me an amazing lecture. You, you, it's simplicity itself, and yet you bring out something that was never clear to me in way back when when Derrida <laughs> burst on the scene. I never knew him as a human being, but, but his um, intellectual brilliance is deconstructing all the rigid systems of philosophy and literary criticism and everything else was extremely exciting. Mm -hmm. But you've asked a very basic question, why? And you've given a wonderful answer, which from the beginning and the end of his life, the beginning being the victim of rigid systems, mm -hmm. of rigid exclusions, and the pain and the, the confusion this causes, right? right? And from the end, I'm trying to learn how to live, at the yeah. very end of his life. Right. A wonderful statement, which sheds a whole different light on the whole activity, right. the frenetic yeah. activity of right. his, of his yeah. thinking. You know, I heard um, George Steiner, mm -hmm. great philosopher, but he doesn't understand, didn't understand Derrida. I remember him saying, there is nothing outside the text, mm -hmm. but a childish graffiti <laughs> on, the, on the walls of civilization. Right. But actually, what you're talking about is that there's nothing outside the text. We're all involved in a kind of intertextual situation by right. our relationships. Exactly. And yeah. when you read yeah. books, Likewise, let the books breathe, let them become texts that are in dialogue, or in right, yeah. kind of um, like Bakhtin, right, or in yeah, kind yes. of engaging with the plurality of voices right, all around. Exactly, yes. Um, I saw the film Silence lately. Did you see that film, by any chance? No, I, yeah, no, no. It, I, mean, it, I mean, yeah, it, it's, it's in my it, list, yeah, yeah. It's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's a deconstructive film, exactly, mm, in mm, your mm, sense. Mm. The characters are all suffering, of course, they're suffering physically because they're being persecuted. But they're also suffering because of the mental fixations. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. the climax of the film is when the, the priest has to step on the image mm -hmm. of Christ, has to apostatize. Mm -hmm. And this is an extraordinary uh, film because it's only at that moment he becomes a real Christian. It's like Buddhism. The Buddha is, is the Buddha because he is not the Buddha. The, mm -hmm. the mountain is the mountain because it is not the mountain. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. As long as we're in, in the grip of undeconstructed images and categories of whatever kind, we're still in samsara. It, mm -hmm. We have to, to realize that and realize where the suffering is coming from. Right, yeah, exactly. Yes, uh, thank you very much for the comments. And as you just mentioned, so there are a lot of uh, the kind of uh, quote unquote uh, limited uh, interpretation of Derrida's uh, text or Derrida's uh, uh, kind of an, uh, deconstruction. And one of the things is that one. Ilya Padrejo text, there is no outside text. So that is one, f one of the very famous uh, phrase. Uh, a statement that appears in Abgrammatology, 1968, his first book. And people say, well, there are, there are a lot of, uh, you know, and some people even say, well, there is a deconstructing text. What you need to deconstruct is not the text, but the life. But for Derrida, text is not, as I said, just a kind of book, right? Our existence itself is text, 
right? And in this text, uh, we kind of, uh, we, we know the expression also context, right? Our text, our existence is always existence in context, right? So if we uh, think about that text and context, uh, there's no way you can get outside of that context. You cannot just exist as yourself uh, without air, without food, or without anything. Where you put yourself, there's a space, right? So there's no way you can get outside of the text. That is exactly the ultimatum of the, that my existence is always already related to all other things, including yourself, including the space. And I think this is a very important kind of statement and understanding, especially in our time, when the world has become more and more globalized, and not even one, not even one individual, but one country cannot survive by itself, right? And we always have this kind of uh, uh, the environmental problems. And this all is really very much connected with this uh, awareness of our existence is already existence within the context. We live in the environment. Instead of we, we have a tendency to objectifying the pro environmental problem as a problem out there. No, we are part of that environment, right? And that is a Derrida's kind of uh, uh, idea of there is nothing outside of tax. We are always already connected. And Buddhist idea of dependent co-arising, right? Me and my environment, they are together. I am in the environment. You cannot kind of detach yourself from your environment, right? Um, thank you very much for your very interesting uh, lecture. Uh, my question would be, um, you said Buddha and Derrida share the, the basic um, idea that the idea of relational identity, and this is um, everything is um, interconnected. So the, everything in the universe is uh, interconnected uh, like uh, the Indra's net. Um, so um, the, a question comes to my mind is that, so why there is a division the separation in this world, in this universe, because, for example, and you and I are divided, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, okay, mm -hmm. and and that chair and the desk is divided. Right. So right. if everything is really um, wholly interconnected, mm -hmm. there should not be such divisions. Mm -hmm. But uh, in reality, there is um, right, right, um, right. separation, divisions, and such things. So right. um, does um, Derrida or Buddha has their own answer to this kind of metaphysical yes. questions. Yes. This is my question. Yes, uh, thank you very much. And I think that is a really important question. So I emphasize that both the Derrida and Buddhism see the world, and I am already connected with uh, all other things. Uh, then, then why, to begin with, why are the kind of differences between me and, uh, me and the water, me and the table? Now, the question that why, how, so, so your question can be rephrased as uh, how this division happen? So the assumption is that you started with a kind of, there, there must be oneness to begin with and there, there the division happened. So this is the question of the origin, right? But both the Buddhism and Derrida, they do not get to the origin. They start from the state at this point. In other words, instead of uh, saying that there must be at the beginning the, everything was one and there must be certain cause, something happened which make us divided. That is a metaphysical approach. Buddhist approach and deconstructive approach is that no, you cannot do that. Why? Because once you say at the very beginning, right, at the beginning, then you ask the follow-up question, what happened before the beginning, right? It's, a, it's kind of an endless uh, regression. You cannot, so both Derrida and, and the Buddha says that you cannot talk about the origin, beginning point. So Buddhism has this kind of uh, interesting, smart expression called uh, since the beginningless beginning. Right? And Derrida says that uh, we should talk about the trace before the origin. Right? You cannot say, this was the origin, and then if I spill the water, then it's going to get there. No, that is not that, because then you have to ask, what happened before the origin, right? So both the Derridian uh, Buddhist approach is uh, really, in a way, phenomenological. Let's say that the, let's look at the world as it is. 
We did not create the world. We were born into this world. When I was born, the world was already there. That is a beginning point, both for the Derrida and Buddhism. Because otherwise, you have to create a certain kind of metaphysical origin, which cannot be done, because you have, con you have to constantly regress to the origin. What happened before that, before that, before that, right? So that is there. there. Yes. Yes. So uh, I, I don't study philosophy, but uh, so it's, it sounds like um, there's a lot of interconnectedness involved here. Yes. Uh, but uh, one thing I noticed was that uh, you mentioned violence is kind of uh, three layers of violence, and the first layer was in language, language right. essentially communication. Right. So is there any reconciliation? Because if we're all you know constantly interconnected, but is it, uh, violence kind of inevitable, or what's what's the idea here? In a way that, uh, that's a very good question. So if there's a violence, what do we do with that, right? Is it inevitable? Uh, there might be a little bit different kind of answer from Buddhist side and uh, the constructive side. For Derrida, that is true. So we live in this world, right? In this world, because we use uh, language, because we already have social rules, uh, right? And the violence is inevitable. So what he proposes is, uh, let's get rid of all the violence. Uh, that is another kind of uh, the impossible task. That is why his uh, philosophy is deconstruction. Constantly challenging existing mode of thinking and uh, creating, but at the same time, you should constantly recreate it. So that is why self-deconstruction is uh, important because uh, when we notice the violence, when we are aware of the violence, we should act constantly, right? That's the Derridean side. From Buddhist side, in theory, there is the kind of possibility that uh, you live in the world where that violence is totally eliminated. That is uh, what is meant by this cessation and enlightenment, right? But once you kind of enlightened, perhaps, uh, you will go beyond the violence. But then, that means that you might be away from violence, but the world is still suffering from violence. Right? And if everything is interconnected, you cannot be away from violence unless everybody is away from violence, right? Because we are already connected. So that is what the Jan Buddhism says. I will help sentient beings, however infinite the number is, right? So that is what is called the Buddhist Bodhisattva path. You should constantly trying to get rid of overcoming violence, but for you and for others. So in other words, the question is, you want to know the final goal, right? You want to hear that there is a, we all do, there is a kind of goal we, where we can get rid of violence. But both Buddhism and deconstruction, they say that it is a constant, a consistent, a constant process. That's all we can do. I guess my question was more like, uh, is violence kind of innate? Like it's something that is part of us, so we can't get, we can't get It's innate in, a, in human society. It's innate in, in a society because as Derrida says, there's a language, we use language, we, right? There we, the society need a rules and the laws. As far as there are rules and the laws, there are violence, right? Yeah, so it's an inevitable reality, right? That might sound a little bit pessimistic, but what actually, <laughs> even, though, yeah, even though you do not want to go in that direction, but what Derrida and Buddhism are trying to tell you is not actually that pessimistic view, but that is the kind of environment where we live. But we also have a capacity to constantly deconstructing those kind of conditions, right? That, that is a positive part of Buddhism and deconstruction. Right? Instead of uh, let people constantly suffer, right? We can challenge it, a status quo, and then constantly kind of renovate the situation, reducing the suffering, right? Yes? Um, on, on uh, so in this absolute, absolutist society of like good, evil, you know, um, 
I don't know, what I'm, what I'm thinking about is like the nuances that happen between these two. Like I feel like his theories of deconstruction only function because of the fact that there is polar opposites or absolutes mm -hmm. and how he wants to deconstruct them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I feel like in language and mm -hmm. art come the nuances that make mm -hmm. things beautiful and our appreciation for mm -hmm. them. Mm -hmm. And uh, I can see what constantly practicing compassion can do for that. Mm -hmm. But then I feel like there would be like a blandness or like a flat lining somewhere in between. Mm -hmm. So you're saying that the, whether there is a deconstruction functions only in a society where there, there are these opposites. Yes. Like, is there, what happens when, if everyone... When, there's a, when yeah. there's a society which yeah. doesn't have this uh, binary opposite. Yeah. Name one. Well, you know, because <laughs> you brought up, like, uh, how he talked about Marxism, so I was thinking about, like, the Marxist, like, utopian society. Mm -hmm, like. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, Marxism is another, the specters of Marx, uh, in, in, in there, what Derrida said is that, well, that came in 1993 after the, the Eastern Bloc has ended and the fall of the Berlin. And then some people say that uh, Marxism ended. And Derrida says that's where specters of Marx, right? Nothing can com com completely disappear in the world, right? Even though Marxism does not have that much a kind of dominant power as the time of Soviet Union or Eastern Bloc, but the idea of Marxism still exists in our intellectual history, right? So Marxism stays as a specter, like a trace in us, right? And even Marxist society is not the society which he, there is no kind of margin and center. It was the ideal he wanted to create, which he, I don't think ever actually happened in human society, right? So, well, if there is a society in which this dualism does not exist, well, there's no need of for deconstruction. Okay. Unfortunately, I don't know any. If you know one, let me know. If you find one, let me know. <laughs> well, in, yes. in, in his first book, he was talking about Rousseau. Yeah. And Rousseau was very concerned to look for that kind of society. Mm -hmm. He kept looking back mm -hmm. and couldn't. Mm -hmm. so, so I think it's, there's, uh, his first book kind of speaks directly to your question. Right, 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 yeah, 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 yeah exactly, yeah. So that is, a, that was a, Derrida's deconstruction of Rousseau's idea, right, right of grammatology, when, yes, uh, when he talked about uh, also the Emil and the critique and supplementariness. Uh, so yes, the, any idea which he trying to give uh, like uh, a permanent uh, essence to one side, like uh, it, whether nature or whatever. From Derrida's perspective, uh, that is limited because the concept of nature does not exist without culture, right? If we do not have all these uh, things, uh, civilization, what you call civilization or culture, we wouldn't be bothered by the concept of nature, right? Because it's uh, there already, right? Yeah, so yes, thank you. In that case, if I may, uh, yes. I have a comment. <laughs> Uh, during your first reply, you've mentioned that deconstruction has no purpose. Mm. No, it's not actually, doesn't have a meaning in itself. Um, that is partially true, mm -hmm. otherwise it wouldn't serve as a method. Okay. But in the very interview, the last interview that you've used to make a parallel mm -hmm. with Buddhist teachings, there's something I find really interesting, mm. and it refers to something European. Right, because yeah. Because he's European, mm -hmm. even though he's born in Algeria. Mm. And I'm going to briefly read this passage. He says, what I call deconstruction, even if it's directed against something European, is European, is a product of Europe, a reflection of Europe on itself, as experience of a radical otherness. And then he says, Europe has been, since the days of enlightenment, in a permanent state of self-critique. And in this tradition of perfectibility, there is a hope for the future. Mm -hmm. At least, I hope so. Mm -hmm. So this permanent state of self-critique mm -hmm. for past few centuries has made Europe a powerhouse, not just economy, not just industrialization, this is where all these ideas come from. Mm, mm. And uh, Derrida was also fond of Michel Foucault. He mentions it in the uh, interview itself. Uh, they both also explore 
the, the very same thing can be said not only when it comes to Europe uh, as an experience of a radical otherness mm -hmm. and in a, being in a permanent state, state of self-critique, but what, what I can make a parallel to including also Buddhist teachings mm -hmm, is that mm -hmm. it's a quest for, a, so to speak, a self-perfectionment mm. in an individual sense. Mm. Would you care to comment uh, sure. on that? <laughs> Okay, so starting from Derrida and then Buddhism. Okay, so here, the passage you read, I, I kind of responded with uh, ambivalence. Uh, first, uh, there is a hope for the future. That is true. That's uh, why I said that uh, either Buddhism or deconstruction is not pessimist. There is a hope for the future, which is a constant deconstruction, right? So even when he talk about democracy, he talk about democracy, democracy to come. A democracy avenir. In other words, it is not that there is a certain form of democracy which will come someday. It is a de democracy which will always to come because it needs to kind of renew itself all the time, right? And that is a hope for the future. On the other hand, his position about Europe is kind of interesting. Mm -hmm. So he started with Bogomatology. Uh, he talked about Eurocentrism as a problem of Western philosophy. But as he move on, he gradually, in a way, begin to insinuate that Europe is the kind of hope for the future. And that become very clear after the September 11th. There is a kind of interview with Jacques Derrida and Eugen Habermas after September 11th. And uh, the, that uh, interview appealed as a uh, philosophy in a time of terror. There he kind of proposed Europe as a kind of possible hope for the future. And that becomes more and more kind of part of his idea, right? So that is, in a way, I feel that go against his original critique of Eurocentrism, which could be any centrism should be criticized from deconstructive perspective. But later he began to say that Europe has this power because American hegemony does not know what to do with themselves and so on and so forth, right? So I think he is contradicting himself there. For Buddhism, yes, the Buddhist practice is for self-perfection. But this is self-perfection without final goal. Because if you think that there is a perfection which comes to an end, that is not a perfection. Because life does not end. And in life, we kind of encounter different things each and every moment. And that is a Buddhist practice. right? So just imagine this before I ask you, what did you eat for lunch, right? Imagine today you had a great, great lunch, the best lunch you ever had in your life, right? But tomorrow, you will have to eat again, right? You will have to eat lunch. I don't know. Perhaps you can skip breakfast, but you will have to eat again tomorrow the next day. In other words, our body needs a constant kind of intake and a kind of a to survive. And the same is this mental training in Buddhism, right? We constantly trying to practice for perfection, but that this perfection actually, Prajnaparamita, does not mean that there is an end point in this perfection. It is constant effort. Right? That is the hope. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Other comments, questions? Maybe I'll just ask yeah. a question. Please. Um, I think we, uh, you said earlier about solitude, kind of like as a problem, uh, that people can be excluded, mm. kind of like marginalized. Mm -mm -mm. I know that people can have like a natural kind of solitude. Uh, um, maybe I misunderstood that this would be like a kind of a problem. Oh, so that uh, there, um, Derrida says that there are two types of solitude. This is his reading of La uh, uh, Suba, his reading of Robinson Crusoe. You know, Robinson Crusoe, story of Robinson Crusoe, who got shipwrecked and he got to the island and there's nobody to live there, right? So, anyway, the idea is there are two types of solitude. The original natural solitude that we all face because we are human beings with mortality. Uh, on the other hand, there is another solitude what he calls the solitude of law. In other words, like him, as he experienced as a 12-year-old boy, if my society, my government, trying to keep me out of school because I'm a Jewish, 
Then there comes, I'm all alone. Even my government does not support me. Right. And he says, my language, he speaks French as an Algerian French, right? And he says, French is the only language I know. He knows several languages, but French is my language. But that is not my language because a perfect French is not even French in France. It should be French in Paris. You know, this kind of idea of center and margin, right? This is the kind of solitude, the loneliness we face in a society which is dominated by the law of, or logic of exclusion. So in the, in the latter, it is a problem. The former, solitude is a condition of our existence. We cannot even say it's a problem, right? We have to deal with it. I was kind of thinking I would like to change the word to aloneness. Mm -hmm. uh, in contrast to loneliness. Okay. That maybe we could look upon, we use the word aloneness. Mm, uh, 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 yeah. That this actually can be very positive, that one is not dependent. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, e not that one is excluding. Right, yeah, yeah. That one, that emptying out, mm, mm, mm. that aloneness is uh, quite fulfilling. And I think of Gautama himself in the last phase of his quest alone under the tree, mm -hmm. get the feeling that, that he ends up with a problem, but somehow that it's like a positive aloneness or salvation. Right, so that is a kind of right, very... That's the extent. Right, but that is, I think, that's a very good point, and, and in a way, I think that is what Buddhist meditation kind of happens, right? So you separate yourself uh, temporarily from the society and then trying to really discover yourself. But then there comes this uh, um, aloneness. It's not something, shouldn't be something permanent in that case, because you will have to, and you should come back to the society so then you can help others, right? Exercise compassion. So in a way, aloneness as a kind of situation through which you trying to discover yourself through Buddhist practice, that is certain kind of uh, environment, specific environment for your practice in Buddhism, right? So yeah, you're right. In the case, you perhaps need to make a kind of distinction between solitude and aloneness and the loneliness and all this. Thing. Yeah, I, was, I think that when Gautama does relate, he's not losing it. He's not losing that sense. Of aloneness. Yes. That there's, um, I think in Buddhism, they are in Japanese society, they have, maybe some Japanese <coughs> companies, but they have sabi. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Of sabi, mm -hmm. where something in itself, like the Taoist says, it's already returned mm -hmm, mm -hmm, to mm -hmm. its Taoist source. Even though it's extinguished, it's still right, the yeah. source. Of, yeah. where, so there's this sort of like independence, even mm -hmm. while it is related. Right, exactly. If we say that is a kind of finding yourself as an individual, right, while being aware of your relationship with others, and that what you said is correct, right? Well, on that note, I'm afraid we've run out of time. That's all the time we have for ten tonight. And I would like to thank Professor Park for her lovely discussion. Thank you very much. And all of you who attended Thank this you. lecture. And I would like to invite you also to keep an eye for the lectures to come. And you're welcome anytime. So <laughs> feel free to stay and talk to Professor Park if you feel sure, like yes. you want to ask further questions. Thank you. <laughs>